Hi, my name is Monica, and um, I work on the Texas Peach Applied Research Team at Google. And today um, I'm going to be talking to you about optimizing training data sets for expressive text to speech synthesis. So I'm assuming most of you in this session are familiar with the concept of TTS, but perhaps some are not. And you just um, came here to hear about something new. Uh, so very briefly, a text-to-speech system takes text as input and converts it um, to speech by means of a text-to-speech engine and an associated voice model. And the training data that we're going to be talking about today is for that voice model. Um, and on the next slide, I wanted to play you a sample utterance from a typical training corpus for a text-to-speech voice model. Manhattan District Attorney Cyrus R. Vance Jr. announced Wednesday that 94 people had been indicted on various charges. It's a very nice sample. I like it. You can hear it's clear, it's carefully articulated, it's neutral and even in tone, and that's by design. So I'm a single speaker. And um, the acoustic quality is um, pretty good. So I want to leave you with a different sample, and we're going to come back to it later. Um, and I want you to think how you would approach training a voice model on something more like this. I do that. Yeah, I do too. I still I do, do it all the time. Yeah. 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 Instead of y'all. <laughs> I do use y'all. Yeah. It's so it's so useful. It's like, why isn't there a word that is the plural you in English? It exists in Spanish. We do. It exists it's in so many. Yeah. Well, okay, so yes. Yeah. Very different sample. More fun as well, but very different. Um, we can hear it's spontaneous and conversational. It's expressive, uh, variable in tone. Obviously, we can hear multiple speakers in the sample. And the acoustics still high quality, but we're hearing some overlapping speech. Um, so something, a challenge that we will probably need to deal with um, before any modeling task is attempted. Some stats on training data in seconds, because the sample on the previous um, slide, and the short one was actually only seven seconds long. Uh, the longer conversational sample, it really felt quite long. It felt long to me when I was playing it, but it actually only was 17 seconds long. Now, a typical um, training data requirement for an older generation standard concatenative system is about five hours. Um, so I want you to think how many seven second utterances you would need to build that um, five hour training corpus. A concatenative system essentially creates an index of speech units from the training corpus and then at runtime selects it to stitch together, so to say, um, a new utterance. Uh, that's why my previous comment about the data being very even in tone and neutral, that that was a technical requirement um, precisely for um, to facilitate this kind of approach. A few years ago, um, we did an experiment um, or we started a big project where we really tried to see whether we could reach a ceiling, the quality ceiling for concatenative TTS. And we recorded a ton of data. Uh, we recorded about 65 hours. It was a lot of work and a lot of effort uh, from multiple teams and multiple uh, people. And think again, how many seven second utterances we needed um, to build a 65 hour corpus. I'm glad we moved to neuro approaches, um, but it's not without its um, challenges. Wagnet in particular, great 
res results in great quality, but is very, very data hungry. Um, we started when we moved to WaveNet, we started with 30 hour training Copra. Um, we're going to talk about um, how we decrease that later on, but this is where we started. Again, 30 hours, it's a lot of speech. Um, how many seven or 17 second samples um, do you need to build a 30 hour speech corpus? Now about the, um, the voice model itself and uh, what kind of quality um, we are familiar with right now, um, given the different um, backends available to us. So we're probably all familiar with the standard neutral TTS, very versatile, appropriate, appropriate for many situations. We probably use it, you know, for um, GPS navigation, um, some basic content reading. Um, it probably sounds something like this. Thanks for splitting this donut with me. I was hungry. So this is a basic neutral sample, um, but there are scenarios or um, where users expect even more natural speech, more lively, more emotional, more expressive. Um, so we started working on um, training better Prosody models uh, to drive um, more expressive synthesis. Um, and I'll play you the previous sample again, and then a second one side by side, so we can compare how the same voice performs uh, with a different prosodic model. Um, and the emotional tone that we're going here for is uh, lively. So let's listen to these two samples. Thanks for splitting this donut with me. I was hungry. Thanks for splitting this donut with me. I was hungry. I hope we agree that the second sample did sound more lively, more natural. Um, and the previous one was just like a flat, neutral, intelligible, high quality TTS, but there is more emotion in the second one. It's not just about emotions. Uh, when we talk about expressive TTS, it's also about serving different um, domains, uh, different scenarios. You might want to have a specific voice to read specific type of content to you, be it news or chat messages or even poetry. Uh, you could also have TTS that has a particular style appropriate for a particular situation. Imagine you're, it's late at night and you have kids that are already asleep and you're whispering um, in the house and you're whispering to your device and you would expect the device to perhaps whisper back to you. So if it were TTS um, and you would expect it to whisper to you back, it might sound like this. Okay, 5.30 a.m. Setting your alarm. 5.30 a.m. is very early. Definitely too early for me. Uh, but this is how... Um, Whisper TTS sounds like. And again, we achieve all that with um, data. Um, there's a ton more that I could play um, showcasing a different emotional style, um, different content style. Um, and essentially, it's a little bit like, you know, software 2.0 when you're driving. Um, this new software performance solely with data. Um, and this is really where we are, where our backends are so reliable and so quality that um, pushing the quality and making voices more expressive really comes down to feeding more training data to the model, uh, more varied training data set, um, more extreme in its expressivity. Um, and this is where we are now. And when I'm thinking about our goals for the next few years for TTS, I'm going to play you a sample that is not TTS, it's an actress, and it's a sample from a movie. But this is what I think about when I think about uh, what we want to build next. Good morning, Theodore. Good morning. You have a meeting in five minutes. You want to try getting out of bed? <laughs> You're too funny. <laughs> okay, good. I'm funny. It was just a brief sample. I'm trying to keep the samples brief. They're necessary really to illustrate um, my points, but I'm mindful of the time. Um,
But even in this very brief sample, you see how many things are happening, how many things she's doing with her voice. Um, and you have to think about the labels that we would apply to describe all these events that we're hearing in this little sample. So given the demand for TTS and what I just said about driving quality with data and always feeding different or better training data to the model to be able to um, flex its capabilities, um, those are the things that we're thinking when we're building TTS at Google. Um, you know, you want to have voices of different style and of course, different age and gender and voices that users could pick because simply they like them. Uh, they like the sound of them. Um, you want the voice to be able to express many, many different emotions um, to handle different kinds of content. I mentioned poetry earlier, um, reading dialogue, uh, reading books, reading news. Um, you want to think about the various attitudes that the voice conveys. Um, you also want to think whether a voice can represent a brand as well. Um, and do you want to think about all that for multiple, multiple languages that Google offers services in? Um, so I'm trying to paint a picture of the demands that we have for voices and what goes with that, the demand for data. Um, as we explained earlier, all of these, um, each and every one of, this, um, of these features requires um, more training data. Um, so I'm gonna just show you here to illustrate how many emotions we're dealing with. This is the Yale mood meter and it has uh, valence and arousal axes. And this is a neat way to um, think about emotions in a more organized way, in a more principled way, um, and think about how many targets you have to hit if you want to build a TTS voice that can handle emotions comprehensively. You can see that they are arranged in different quadrants, um, depending on their valence and arousal values. Um, and we use that for uh, data labeling in our work. So how do we control the data uh, bottleneck? A few years ago, when we were working on this big project and we collected a lot of data, 65 hours of data, I began to think about this, that this is really not sustainable and you know, we won't be able to do this for every voice that we want to launch. In the field of CTS, we have something, um, we have a scientific challenge called the Blizzard Challenge, where multiple text-to-speech systems can be compared and contrasted um, because the challenge uses the same training data set for each of them. And if you participate, you get the training data set and then um, you try to build a voice out of that and um, then we can compare quality across different systems, but using the same training data. And I kept thinking about the reverse. How about we had like a reverse Blizzard challenge where we stress test one system and we measure its performance on different training corpora. Um, and we learn something from it and perhaps we can find that sweet spot where it makes sense to create, curate and collect just enough training data um, to get the quality that we want, but in a way that still enables scale given the demand for TTS. So we started first looking at what we already had. At that point, we already had uh, multiple uh, corpora for Texas speech, <coughs> mostly in US. And we started looking at um, what quality they, um, they offer. Um, I'm presenting here the quality that um, each of the voices achieved using our standard um, production LSTM system. Um, and the red um, shows you 
the size of the training corpus in hours. I'm just trying to very simply represent the quality. I'm not going to go into details how we measure quality, but just imagine a scale from one to five. And you can see that the blue line, it doesn't really change a lot, um, even though uh, we have this big variation in the sizes of the training corpora. So that made me think, and I thought, we have to explore this more. So as next step, we designed a proper experiment where we created very scientific and very carefully curated training corpus, um, where on the one hand, we introduced more features that we look at um, generating the corpus, and we wanted to look beyond just um, phonological features um, and start looking also at some pragmatic and semantic features and sentence structures just to perhaps tackle the data redundancy that we were seeing in the previous experiment. You know, maybe we don't really need any more, I don't know, approximate sequences in our training corpus, but maybe we actually need to um, see a different level of commitment of the speaker as they are producing those sequences of approximants. Um, so we repeated it for a number of speakers just to control for speaker variability. And here I'm showing you results for two voices where we created um, built voices at 20% intervals in our modular training corpus, and we were able to track how the quality changes with um, the training data changes. And you can see that there is a quite a big jump early on. Again, we're, losing, we're using the LSTM backend. Um, and then it kind of tapers off, and then the quality does still increase, but not as dramatically. And then you have to start asking yourself what the trade-off here is. Do you, are you really willing to invest more in providing more training data? Um, or perhaps you've reached that sweet spot and you know 378 makes sense. Um, we then thought, um, okay, like let's start, you know, we have 10 hours. It seems like it gives us good quality, but then we have this multitude of um, you know, features that we want to have in the voice. We want all these different emotions and we want all these different styles and just things about the voice. And we started thinking about voice creation in this modular way. Um, and over time, we were building these modular data sets um, that showed us that from one speaker, we can, um, in a very regular and principled way, uh, we can try to model different prosodic effects. So we started viewing voice creation as a very modular process. Uh, when we first capture a little bit of just neutral data and we're still questioning whether we actually need this uh, just to get some baseline for the speaker. And then we started adding those more tailored modules um, to drive quality on different domains. And in this way, we, for example, created a newscaster voice um, or we want to drive quality on different um, emotional um, um, emotional styles. Um, so we added, you know, a module for lively or angry or somber. And now we're also thinking like, what are the next modules, right? Are there modules for, for brands or for uh, some pragmatic features or um, what else, right? Um, and then we started thinking how we can do this at scale. And we started combining speakers and actually moved fully to multi-speaker training with very good results. So essentially, uh, we have this huge repository of modules characterized by different features, you know, emotional, pragmatic, semantic, or speaker features. Um, and this allows us to somehow, in some limited way, um, tackle the scale question um, and the data bottleneck. And we're able at this point to produce a lot more voices serving a lot more domains, a lot more languages, um, while still keeping the data footprint manageable in many ways.
I think we're at the stage now where um, what comes next is going to be very, very challenging. You know, we learned how to model a single emotion um, or a sequence of five emotions or 10 emotions. But now the next step for text-to-speech is to learn how to model all this all at the same time. And it's a, it's a very daunting challenge. And whenever I speak to my colleagues, um, I always try to approach this very calmly. Like we know it's gonna be a lot of work and a lot of meticulous experimentation before we make any progress that is noticeable to the user. It's a daunting challenge, but um, I'm trying not to um, be discouraged by this. So we're trying to think very deeply what the features of spontaneous conversations are, how we would express them, what kind of labels we would need and what it is that we actually need to model. Um, and we're also investing a lot into data processing, and that includes tools, you know, markups, um, human in the loop approaches. Um, we really need to understand and annotate what happens in the speech act before we are able to um, to model it accurately. Mm -hmm. You know, it really looks like it's going to go bang. Mm -hmm. You know, it really looks like it's going to go bang. This is a synthesized sample. Um, this is artificial, this is TTS, um, and something that, you know, we're experimenting with. And you can hear that um, in this particular sample, we did something that is called filled pauses. So there is a certain hesitation in the voice. It's not just a sequence of words, but there are some effects that we're hearing there that... Um, characterize how people really speak in a spontaneous way. Um, let's listen to it again. Mm -hmm. You know, it really looks like it's going to go bang. And, you know, we, um, I wanted to refer to the sample that um, I played earlier, because this was actually the sample that um, we used for training um, of this particular model. You see it's still in very early stages. I do that. Yeah, I do too. I still we do, do it all the time. Yeah. 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 Instead of y'all. <laughs> I do use y'all. Yeah. It's so, it's so useful. It's like, why isn't there a word that is the plural you in English? It exists in Spanish. We do. It exists it's in so many. Yeah. Well, okay, so yes. Yeah. So a lot of efforts uh, that we have right now going in the team are geared towards this, towards learning how to process this kind of data and drive quality um, on domains that are highly spontaneous and conversational. Um, I'm happy to chat about this some more and... Um, can email me with questions or ask questions later, uh, but it's a it's a huge challenge. Um, first, eliciting those natural conversations in a controlled environment between multiple speakers. Like we need multiple speakers. We don't really talk to um, I know to the mirror, right? Like you need other participants to really have a spontaneous and fully expressive conversation. Um, it's a challenge to isolate the audio tracks. It's a challenge to grasp what really is happening in this exchange, to label it accurately, um, and to just decide what makes sense to model for, for TTS. So this is where we are now, um, trying to learn how this sounds. And I'm just gonna leave you with um, a sample that we already know how to confidently do, and this is also TTS. And listen to this, I think this is pretty expressive. Google Fi, a phone plan by Google. Get data abroad at no extra charge with a little help from Google Fi. Yes, we're getting better and we're getting more expressive. And I hope that modeling truly spontaneous and um, natural conversation will come next. And uh, perhaps that vision that Scarlett Johansson had in the movie um, will come true and we will be able to um, provide users with this kind of natural um, and expressive text-to-speech experience. 
I think we have a few minutes for questions now. I'm also putting my um, email address here. Um, if you don't get a chance to ask questions now and you prefer to email me later. Thank you.